move that? I don't. Is that good? I'm still seeing it. I don't know. Yeah, this is this is my little video panel so that I can see you all. I know. Okay, I'll you've probably... raised it to a point where I think uh, we'll be able to see everything on the screen. It was I didn't want it to block all that good stuff. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. Yes, and please uh, feel free to hop on in whenever some weird technical stuff pops in. I also turned on Chime um, when someone raises their hand, so um, I will be notified when you raise your hand. Hopefully, if Zoom doesn't cancel out my settings as it tends to do sometimes. What okay. a great way to give an auditory output, huh? Yeah, right? <laughs> Alrighty. So the objectives for this session, there are four. The first is to familiarize ourselves with gaming as an occupation. I know that we as therapy staff like to think of gaming as a means to providing therapy services. But I'm here to tell you today that gaming is just important as an occupation, as a way for us to relax, to socially connect, to also just kind of um, engage and uh, with others today. So learn. Uh, we also want to learn about the current state of gaming. Um, so what does that look like today? What is the current generation of gaming and gaming developers trying to do? I also want us to equip ourselves with resources to help our clients and or students. And of course, having fun talking about my favorite hobby. Uh, so let's begin. So quickly, you can put in the chat, who here believes they are a gamer? And I'm gonna open my chat window. I know that will bring out a little box here that might block the screen, so. Oh, awesome, Chandra. Anyone else? I'm also very patient, so y'all can also purchase. Oh, board gaming. I love board gaming. Uh, Settlers of Catan, love it. Um, I also dabbled in D&D &D <laughs> for a little bit, which is kind of like board gaming, except not really. Um, okay. I'm not so, sure what it takes to be a gamer. Yeah, definitely. What's so, the definition of a gamer? I like to and, play games. <laughs> yeah, for sure, Deb. So... And as I have here on the slide, anyone can be a gamer. And the reason why I say that is how many of you have gone on Facebook and played Farmville or maybe on your phone and played Candy Crush or anything of the sort? If you played any of those types of games, you are in fact, oh, exactly, Farmville, 100% Animal Crossing, love it. Um, so even though you might not consider yourself a gamer, the definition of gaming, uh, of being a gamer is very broad. There's no like, you know, official Oxford definition of like what it means to be a gamer. There might actually be, but really in the, in the, in the world of gaming, there are various subcultures in gaming. For those who might just very much dabble in it, you know, playing Farmville, Candy Crush, you can consider yourself a casual gamer. If you've interacted with anything um, related to electronics that involved you, you know, going through a level or returning to a virtual screen and then clicking on things, um, that is gaming. So there are hardcore gamers who, which I consider myself a hardcore gamer, and those are individuals that can, that follow the industry <laughs> day in and day out. Um, folks at work might see me um, listening to gaming podcasts or gaming videos as I write up my case notes, all of that. But you also have your casual gamers who engage in it from time to time. So there are various genres in gaming. These are just a few handful of what these genres are in gaming. So just like reading a book, or movies, we all have different genres, right? In gaming, we have things like role-playing games, real-time strategy games, action RPGs, tactical RPGs, puzzles, strategies, fighting, FPS, or first-person shooters. I don't expect you all to actually know what these word salads, like alphabets are. It's just more so the idea that if you have a kid or a student who is interested in gaming, my whole point is to give you a vocabulary to try and relate to them so that you can go on Google, search up role-playing game, RTS, and 
have some examples of what those video games are. All righty. So for more concrete examples, here are some specific video games. We have Super Mario Brothers. I'm sure you all know Super Mario. I watched a movie that just recently came out. Honestly, one of the best video game movies I've ever seen. This is the most recent release, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Then you have Roblox over here. How many of you heard of Roblox before? Yeah, exactly. This is a very popular and multi-million dollar game um, where in which users can interact as well as create their own game within a game. So they can take those genres that I just talked about and make games in this game. Pretty great way for kids to socially interact with each other. But of course, right, with any so social interaction, it is important for us to express to the parents, like, please monitor your kids. Anything with online, let's monitor our kids. One of the biggest franchises out there right now is The Legend of Zelda, and this is the most recent release called Tears of the Kingdom. I myself have not played it, um, but I've heard it's amazing, and it's great because you're able to basically construct like these Lego pieces and create like a car. I've seen people create mechs. I've seen people, oh man, create like a uh, a UFO where they're able to use that and fight their enemies or traverse the open world of Zelda. Then we have Elden Ring. And this is something that um, I would love to talk to you all about, but I just don't have the time to. But I bring this one up because Elden Ring is a action RPG. It is infamous for having the sparking the conversation on accessibility and difficulty settings. So, so in video games, most video games have difficulty settings, where in which you can choose easy, medium, hard, you know, and that kind of scales the way in which enemies that you face or the challenges or timers that you have um, are adjusted so that it can either lead to an easier experience or a harder experience. Elden Ring does not have a difficulty setting. And this has caused a lot of controversy in uh, the gaming sphere as to does that actually make it accessible and do games need difficulty settings? And it's a conflict between art, right? And accessibility. Big conversation. Just wanted to let you all know that this is an ongoing conversation that has happened for decades. And then you have simulator things. They're kind of silly but it's kind of like power wash simulator where you're literally just sitting down on your couch and power washing things all without the mess of actually needing to deal with the dirt, the grime, the water bill that comes with power washing. I've done this myself. Um, I kick back at the end of the week and I'm like, you know what? I live in an apartment. I can't power wash. Let me power wash this. So the question now is, what are the platforms that we use to engage in gaming? And those are, at least in the current generation, the Nintendo Switch, the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series S and X, and you also have mobile gaming, such as uh, the Android phones, as well as iOS or Apple phones. And then my personal favorite, because it's so modular and you can basically, you know, if you can think about it, you can try and you can basically figure out a way to make it work for you. And that's gaming on your computer. Uh, my biggest dream of all time, now that I'm actually working in a full career, is to build my own desktop. <laughs> uh, as of right now, I'm just gaming on a gaming laptop. All right. So before I jump into the assistive tech part in gaming, does anyone have any questions about gaming in general? I'll give you all about a minute to field in those questions. And I'm also going to take a sip of my smoothie. Sandra, I can't help you with that one. 
Um, <laughs> I wish I could, but I can't. It's therapeutic, you said. <laughs> it is therapeutic. It is definitely therapeutic. I mean, maybe well, as as Chandra, as the person who um, uh, supports the loan library, I think there may be a way for you to make sure that switches and tools work with these games. So we can talk, friend. We can She's talk. Amazing, isn't she and amazing? If, and people? if it's therapy, if it's therapy along the side, well, then good. You're a happier camper. Awesome. <laughs> Alrighty, well, hopping in now to the assistive tech portion in gaming. So what I'm going to be going over now is both the hardware aspect, so the physical components about, you know, what you can actually attach or hook up to a gaming console or computer. And I'll also be talking about the software. So those downloadable components that you would need to work um, within the operating system of the console or the computer. So the hardware, we have the quad stick and I have pictures of this in the next couple of slides. Um, so just bear with me, we have the quad stick, which is for individuals that have orthopedic impairments um, so that they were able to um, basically use your mouth or your head to be able to um, manipulate things on the screen. You have the Flex controller, which is for the Nintendo Switch, which is similar to the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Essentially, these are things where they're modular, where you can put, you have this like hunk of plastic right here. And let's say you have a switch, you know, a big red or joystick that you can plug in. And from there, you can basically map out, let's say, a B button to crouch. You can push a, you can plug in a switch there and that switch now becomes your B button in order to crouch. You also have these custom made headphones um, that basically converts surround sound into a mono um, output. And this is great for those who might have hearing loss or hearing deficits, where in which they, um, you know, let's say that their left ear is where they're hearing impaired they're able to funnel the entirety of the audio into their right. Because most games these days, um, though they have a mono audio output, rely on surround sound. So things that are happening to the left side of your screen, you'll hear it come out from your left speaker. Things on your right side of the screen will come out onto your right speaker. This will channel it all in into one output so that you are able to actually hear the full thing. All right, so these are examples. So this right here is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Um, this is pretty much like the gold standard for consoles right now. Uh, like I said, these little things right here, it's not a high quality picture, uh, but these are different button maps that you can then plug into and thus um, link a switch to the B button, A button, right trigger, left trigger, etc. You also have the Nintendo Switch Flex Controller. This is essentially, like I said, like the Xbox Adaptive Controller, um, except for the Switch. This is actually not officially supported by Nintendo. This is a third-party app. Xbox Adaptive Controller was created by Microsoft because they have an express purpose on making gaming more accessible to people. This is also a customized headphone um, made by a singular guy. Um, he's pretty cool, um, and he has hearing loss, which is why he himself wanted to create something that still allows him to enjoy his hobby, um, despite the challenges that he might face. And finally, this is a quad stick. I have a video showing this on the next slide that I will be showing you all. Alrighty, let's get to that. So this is a quad stick. The audio is pretty soft. Again, to close out of this, I'll use the lip switch for X. To attack, I do a single center puff. I can also block and then counter attack by doing a center sip and then a center puff. You can tell that I'm on mode two because I'm able to run away while also looking around me. 
So as you can see here, this is how she is able to move. She is sipping and puffing to and basically then... make all the different movements and switching between modes between combat and movement. I will say one of the downsides of the quad stick is you kind of need to get a grant for this because it is very, very expensive. The last time I checked, it is in the thousand dollar range. So most most of the times you have, uh, oh my gosh, Wayne, yes, I actually have that on one of my slides. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the This usually is required to have like a charity come in. We have, there's a charity called Able Gamers that helps out for veterans. They have, um, there's another one that, my gosh, the name of it is escaping me right now, but I have it in the resources. So, you know, if you have a gamer that might be older um, and it would like to game and is a veteran, they can help you out there. Nathan, um, yes. is the Xbox controller interface with a desktop at all? Um, yes, it does. It does. Um, and that's why I really like um, Microsoft in this sense, uh, because you are able to make it interface with the Xbox controller. So the Xbox adapt. So if we're talking about the Xbox controller or the Xbox adaptive controller, both work. Um, and the Xbox adaptive controller um, is about a hundred dollars. So you know it's not it, it's not the cheapest, but it's also not incredibly expensive. <clears throat> so the software portions of things. So. Um, I'll, I'll talk about in-game settings in a little bit, but this is specifically talking about the built-in software that is included in the consoles and in our mobile phones. So Sony, uh, which is the PlayStation 5, built into their console is a zoom function, color correction and text resizing, mono audio for headphones, and a screen reader. But with the caveat is these don't work all the time, depending on the game, because there are no current um, mandated like uh, accessibility formats that the game developers need to need to um, what's the word? They need to adhere to. We also have a Nintendo Switch, uh, which has Zoom and assist modes. Yet again, on some games, not all games have assist modes. And then we also have Microsoft, which is, again, uh, by far has the most um, accessibility settings. Narrator, um, so there's someone that, there is a setting that will help, that will narrate what is being so shown on screen. Copilot, which is cool. It basically allows you to have two controllers where you can take like a single player game move it around, um, have one person use the thumbsticks to move the character while another person can be pressing the buttons to be um, engaging in combat. I have also seen individuals take these two different controllers, one put them on their uh, one for their foot and one on their unaffected arm and still be able to engage in their hobby by doing that. Um, and then again, it has similar features to the PS5. Whether or not the game actually supports it is another thing altogether. You then also have iOS and Android, and these are accessibility settings that um, I'm sure that we all are at least semi-familiar with. There are screen readers. We have the magnification tool that is um, uh, possible here. And then you also have the compatibility with game controllers and mice, um, which also includes the Xbox adaptive controller, which is crazy. Um, so for those who like to game on an iPad or a tablet, you are able to do that. And I see here from Leslie, are there tools for people who use eyes, eye gaze and switches? So yes, um, there are, but I'm not going to lie. It's not the most robust is the best thing that I can kind of um, explain to you. There is a um, there is a cool open source project that Google has released that I'll be talking about in the next couple of slides that uses head tracking uh, to actually engage in gaming. 
and that that is open source, meaning that any developer can come in and um, work on this specific application um, and then re-release it out um, via GitHub for others to access. So game settings, there are a bunch of different game settings that some games have. And the reason why I'm telling you all of this right now is one, not all games have this, but more importantly, um, I want you to, I want to bring awareness that, that these things exist in these video games. Um, so if a student comes to you and is interested in playing video games, um, you know, you can ask them what specific video game and uh, you can kind of look up online to see the options menu on YouTube. And most games you're able to act, they actually have a video on it, um, especially in the more popular games like Call of Duty, Fortnite, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you have UI adjustments, UI stands for user interface adjustments. This is great. Uh, and someone you might want to use this for is someone who might not have who might need a little less on the screen because they might be cognitively overloaded or vice versa, more things on the screen so that they don't forget what button prompt to use to attack or to jump or to crouch. A hint or timer button, this is um, usually found in puzzle games. So usually uh, what happens is if a character is stuck or a player is stuck after X amount of time, um, Yes, we can definitely talk about this um, at the end, Leslie, if that's okay with you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, so with the hint timer button, after a certain amount of time, a hint will pop up and you can change that for some games to um, increase the frequency or even the, even the specificity of that hint to guide the player to engage and complete the puzzle. Bolded colored subtitles, Great to decipher who's talking, auto prompts, basically it'll complete the prompts for you. So usually there's like an on-screen button prompt that pops up. Um, and it completes it for you. Um, difficulty settings, like I talked about, alternative button inputs. So basically being able to remap your buttons presses to make it more um, ergonomic or more friendly for the player so that they can use other parts of their body to engage in that. For example, I can use my A typically as a jump button. Maybe that won't work for someone. You can then um, move it to, let's say, a left trigger on a controller. All right, then you have your volume settings, um, master, which is the, all, the all the volume settings all at once, effects, voice, music, and mono. You have colorblind modes, which, um, hasn't really seen a lot of development in. Um, most just put a filter on it. Um, so, you know, all the various visual um, color blindness that might happen, people tend to, developers tend to just implement a general filter. Um, a high contrast mode, which I'll show you um, in our application portion of this presentation. Um, and then adjusting font sizes and types. Did, did I say voice input for control? So not all games have it, but we are seeing a resurgence in um, voice control video games, particularly using AI to create um, stories that, char that AI characters are able to create for themselves. I can um, talk about that later and maybe even show a video if we have time, or I can put that at, um, in the additional resource folder as well. Super cool, y'all. So the future of gaming, VR use as therapy. I know I talked about how gaming um, should be thought of as an occupation and not necessarily as a means to an end, but people have been using virtual reality as therapy. Oh my gosh, thank you, Noel. That's awesome. Um, see, there's so many things that come out that I just, it's, it's so hard to keep track of everything. Um, you also have Project Leonardo, which I know was mentioned. This is the PlayStation's version of the adaptive controller. It looks very futuresque, um, and we'll see how it works once it comes out. I believe it was 2024, 2025. And then here's Project Game Face. This is something that I think is really awesome, and I really want to share this with you all. This is my smart night room. This is my dog, Wiki. 
and Sammy. And this is my sick gaming computer. I live on the plains of eastern Colorado. This is my new house. My old one burnt down, but we'll get back to that. This is me, Lance Carr. I've got a rare form of muscular dystrophy, so I can't really move my body. For me, playing video games is my link to the world. But I had to stop gaming because this house burnt down along with my adaptive equipment, and I had absolutely no way to play Warcraft or any other computer game. I definitely had a low point. So when I got connected with some cool folks at Google, hey guys. Hey, hey Lance. Lance. I was pretty stoked. We teamed up to develop this thing called Project Game Fix. Yeah, the name is pretty cool. It allows me to precisely control my mouse with my face. It's so precise, I can even write in cursive. Project Gameface uses MediaPipe, which links together a number of different AI models to give you an output. And in this case, the output is a mesh of 468 points on your face and convert that into telemetry like mouse movement or clicks. It runs natively on devices and it only needs an input from a webcam, which to me is one of the most amazing things about it. Controlling my computer with funny faces, it's pretty awesome. You know, the, the face is what we show to the outside world anyway, so why not bring these two things together? There's a beautiful symmetry there. I was stronger when I was six months old than I am now. Muscular dystrophy takes, and this actually added an ability. So it's the first time I've gained something in a physical sense. My hope is to definitely give this technology to everybody who could use it. There are many people out there who have ideas, who have creativity, so we're open sourcing this technology for folks to create miraculous solutions like this one. I just want to make a lot of people's lives better and easier. Well, we're going to get back to it. Thanks for hopping by the plains of Colorado. Oh, you saw me? Look at the edges of the cliffs. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, what was that? He's a, a warlock. Oh. I should have known. So that is Project Game Face. Now, it is a promotional video, so some of you might be thinking, okay, how well does this actually work? Well, because it is a free download and all you need is your webcam, which most laptops include on, um, you're able to try it out for yourself. And I did, uh, I did try this out for myself and this was a couple of months ago. So I'm sure that the program itself has seen multiple iterations and it's gotten better. So the pros, there is a game called Total War Warhammer 3, which is a real-time strategy game where in which you are essentially a general of an army and you are able to command your troops to attack and defeat other enemy armies, capture cities, all of that. Well, I was like, okay, how good is this actually? After a bit of configuring and making it work for myself, I was actually able to play the game completely independent with just my face using my facial muscles, and I actually won a battle. Now, con, it is very finicky, right? Um, so it does take quite a bit of adjusting and trial and error to really get it going. So for example, there's, a, there's one where you're able to raise your eyebrow left and right. That's great that we have these options. I can't raise mine independently. So that was very difficult for me to try and do. but what was great is that I was able to customize it and make it work for me. Um, and with that, I was able to conquer um, those silly little orcs as a chaos dwarf. So, boom. Pretty cool. So, this is the interactive portion, y'all. Um, Jennifer I had a question. Yes. Um, did it make sure. your face muscles tired? Oh, um, it did. I will say it did make my face muscles tired. Um, thank you for bringing that up, Jennifer. Uh, so yes, it is something that we have to, I think that us as therapists need to kind of problem solve and figure out, you know, what, what works for them. And also, you know, um, what are some other things that we can try and figure out to fall back on if their face muscles do get tired? Or is it a thing where, you know, after a couple of minutes, take a rest? And then, you know, that looks like maybe having a video game selection that doesn't require um, constant input by the player. So, for example, like a turn-based strategy game where in which someone can then um, move their character and they have 
all the time in the world to determine what, what they want to do next. So um, did that answer everything? Is this something that can be used with only facial mimic or is it all or nothing? I like to co-play your idea too. Yes. Um, so it is, it, it's, it's not necessarily an all or nothing program. Um, like I said, you you can um, adjust the settings. So things like sensitivity. So for those who might not have big facial movements, you can adjust that so that it's the camera becomes more sensitive to it. Um, or if there's someone that might have um, a lot of spasticity uh, or tremoring going on in their face, you can lower that sensitivity. So the, so the um, threshold it takes for the action to register um, is much lower or higher. Um, yeah. Exactly. It, and it's open source. So if you have a crafty um, computer scientist or, comp or software engineer um, that you know, um, they have the opportunity to actually go into the um, programming and alter things as needed. And again, it's open source. So thousands of other people who are aware of this project are able to collaborate together and create different iterations of it. All right. You know, Nathan, um, yes. when I hear you talking about a topic that I'm very interested in, but but sub-zero on the knowledge of this area, it's really good to know that these things exist for kids. But yeah, I'm going to have to go back and, and slow this way down and listen to it again to know what questions I even have. Have. And so, so I think some of our folks on are probably uh, picking up on and hearing all of the vocabulary and right on par with you. Uh, Chandra probably is. And then I'm, I'm thinking, oh boy, I'd have to phone a friend for this. So um, I, I would love to know uh, how we can provide ongoing support for folks if, if they are, um, if they're like me. I guess I would just say, Jennifer South, can you help me with this person? And knowing that there are other people out there. Yes, and um, also to throw it out there, um, I know that I have already been reached out to um, to kind of consult when it comes to you know troubleshooting certain um, students and trying to get gaming more accessible for them. So. Um, I mean, this is part of what's great about Echo Ties in general, right, is that we create a community where in which, oh, I know a person, I can reach out. And I think you all have like some form of contact information. If not, I can get that over to you, Deb, so that we can send it out to everyone. And mm. it's recorded on YouTube, too. So we can slow it down as need be. Thank yeah. you. This is Noelle. Um, I work at the AT Lab at Community Vision, and we have open lab every Thursday. Um, in case y'all don't know, we are in Southeast Portland. Um, and open lab every Thursday, we have the Xbox um, adaptive controller. We have a bunch of switches. <laughs> and then I am also a gamer, which helps a lot because I'm deeply invested in this. And that's um, how I learned about well, actually, all of these things, like you said, um, you can't keep on top of everything. There's just too many things. But I'm forming a little bit of a gaming, adaptive gaming crew, if you will. If anyone wants to join it, let me know. But I learned about that um, Minecraft eye gaze module or software module from the rec therapist at Shriners, whose name is escaping me right now. That's embarrassing. But um, I'm also starting to do adaptive gaming consults for, I've done two, um, they're $25 right now, an hour, because I don't, I'm still figuring it out, but I just love to talk about it. And anyone in the community can call and reach out. And if you want to chat about it, um, and then, yeah, so that's my plug for that. We don't have anything in the loan closet yet around gaming, but hopefully we will. Thank you so much, no Noelle, uh, for being a resource for that. You are my phone a friend, you and Nathan. Awesome, Noelle, that is amazing. Um, that is so cool. Thank you. Yeah, come by sometime. I don't know if you're in Portland area, but. Yeah, I'm in the tennis point area, so we might need to connect. Yes, will... I think yeah. so. <laughs> I was super pumped about your talk, so. Thank you. All righty, so options menu. Um, I have some multiple choice questions here. Um, so 
just going through all of this real quick with you all, God of War Ragnarok, and this is where you'll see a lot of uh, accessibility kind of moving forward is through first party titles. So these are these are our titles that have been um, developed in house of Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo. That's what I say when that's what um, is meant when I say first party titles. And God of War Ragnarok is one of them. So you'll see here, and this is what I think is like the creme de la creme of accessibility in gaming. You see that they have accessibility presets. Um, so we have vision accessibility, hearing accessibility, motion reduction, motor accessibility. But not just that, these presets are then broken down here where you can adjust it as needed um, based on the person. So you have that with combat, um, audio accessibility. There's a lot more. That's why you have this little scroll bar down here. Then you have um, more options such as audio subtitles, which are things like this, captions, subtitle size. Um, you also have things where it um, has hint uh, notifications that you can then adjust to how frequent you get them. And this is something that's super cool. I haven't seen it in many other video games, which I really hope we start seeing more of a move towards. This is high contrast mode. What you notice here is the rest of the environment, the art is unchanged. However, the interactables like this boat here is highlighted a different color. The player character is highlighted a different color. The enemy is highlighted a different color. So this helps individuals with low vision um, to be able to still participate in gaming, right? Without needing to say, oh yeah, I don't know. I need to put this down to a lower difficulty setting and not something that they want to do, right? So question for you all, what game setting could be most useful for a gamer with a fine motor deficit? A, B, C, or D? All right. Yeah, so the correct answer is A, but while we're at it, we might as well just do these other ones. Who would be good? What uh, what individual would benefit from a high contrast mode? Mm hmm. What about enabling audio cues? So basically, if you come across something in the environment, um, a little audio cue will play. Will play. Yeah, I also think of something like cognition, right? And attention, one-handed users, yeah. What about using the built-in screen reader, which God of War does have, which is amazing. <laughs> because like I said, not many video games actually implement this in their games. Yes. Beautiful. All right. Here's another options menu. <clears throat> so we have NBA 2K23. It's an okay game, but I like it because of the different options it provides. So this is specifically the gameplay options. It's hard to kind of see here. I try to make these as big as possible. Um, but you have here game style. You have rookie, professional, inside shot success you can change these basically to make it like a percentage or how easy it is to make the shot timing so you know if you raise it all the way to the to the far end you don't it really kind of diminishes the need to time um you have adaptive coaching engine which is basically you know allowing an individual to um, have like a coach that tells them what they should be doing timing out player minutes etc cetera, etc cetera. So the settings in available in this game are helpful because of what? Oh. 
Awesome. So this is kind of a trick question. So yes, B, and it could also be C, right? I think one of the things that game developers as a whole need to start to really focus on, yeah, Wayne, it is, um, is that sometimes providing players with too many options can be very overwhelming, which is why I really like what God of War Ragnarok did here is because they're a they have presets that are catered to specific types of disability. Here, while we can adjust all of this, and that's awesome, um, I don't know about you, but when I saw this for the first time, I'm like, oh my God, this is really overwhelming, right? So again, this is why it's important for us to be client-centered or student-centered and really figure out, okay, what is what does you know Tom really need? What is it that... Um, where is it that they are most struggling on? Is it the mid-range success, the three-point success? You know, things like that. All right, here are some things from mobile games and Roblox. <clears throat> As you can see, not many um, accessibility options here. So you have touch sensitivity, which is pretty standard in most mobile games. And in, in Roblox, you don't really have much except this right here the UI toggling um, screen thing. And then, yeah, you can kind of rebind. But what's great about Roblox and why it could also be a great um, accessible game for people is, like I mentioned, people make games within, within this game. So if you're working with a student who, let's say, you know, might have some fine motor um, challenges as well as a cognitive deficit here, um, we can go in and look at the selection of different video games and some are easier to understand and others are much harder and requires more button inputs. So what's great about Roblox and because it's basically like a big playground is that you can choose and cater your, um, your gaming style and games that the student or you engage in um, to match their ability. Here are more. Um, these are, in my opinion, poor examples of accessibility in games. This is Tears of the Kingdom. Nintendo hasn't really hopped on board in terms of the accessibility train quite yet. This is really all they have in terms of options. So camera sensitivity, you know, how, how far do you need to move the joystick in order for the camera to rotate? Um, aiming with motion controls, inverting horizontal camera, vertical camera, vehicle ability. And then you also here have Hogwarts Legacy, where you can't rebind your button button prompts. It may have changed since you know updates. Games are constantly getting updated, but as of right now, they don't have that. Um, and this is very complicated inputs here. All right. Finally, we're in the last two, three-ish slides here, and these will go by just fine because I want to make sure that I respect everyone's time. Let's see. Okay. And so, we have until 9.15. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. Yes. Thank you. All right. So this is the first one. Um, awesome game. I saw Animal Crossing being put out. My partner well, loves this. If you haven't got the fishing rod as of yet, you can get a flimsy fishing rod right at the very beginning of the game from Tom Nook in Resident Services. As soon as you've got that, you just need like five tree branches to be able to make it at the crafting table in resident services. You'll then be able to head out and start fishing. And once you do, what- Okay, so I'm just gonna keep it like this because we're gonna be jumping between videos. Um, can anyone tell me what was the player supposed to do during this fishing mini game? They had to get their own fishing pole, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Just make sure I'm on the right page here. Yeah. So are they rotating the analog stick to reel the fish in? Are they tapping A on the controller or nothing? It does everything by itself. Yeah. Yep. So you are supposed to tap A, but the game doesn't tell you that. It tells you in like a, a quick little like dialogue option and you can go into the options to try and like figure it out when it doesn't actually tell you. All right, so let's compare it to this next game called Cult of the Lamb. It's a cute little game. 
All right, can anyone tell me how do you fish in this game? And that was supposed to say, yep, 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 yep. And that was my bad, that was supposed to say X, <laughs> but you got it. Yes, you're supposed to tap X on the controller and then hold it. So comparing game design, and this is, I bring this up, not because I'm like, oh, let's rag on Animal Crossing because it's a great game. But this is something that I want you all to be aware of, right? That like certain video games do not have um, universal design in mind, right? So what I like about Cult of the Lamb is that it tells you and it walks you through in a very minimal sort of way of how to actually fish, right? You saw that little scrolling icon and it was very apparent whether or not you're in it or not. Um, you have to hold the X, make sure that it remains in the bar, and drop it. It also explains this all to you in the game as well. So it's not just, oh yeah, try and figure this out. It actually tells you. All right. So a little bit of a content warning here. I'm going to turn off the audio on this because this is a military kind of thing. I still think this is important for me to show you all because, you know, a lot of the games out there, a lot of what kids like to play are first-person shooters. Right. So this is kind of what a third person, first person shooter can look like. Right. But I am going to turn off the volume because I know that gun sounds can, you know, um, can inadvertently trigger some individuals. So just want to let you all know. Uh, I'm going to go play that right now. OK. All right, so what button was the grenade button? Yep, so the correct answer is tapping LB on the Xbox controller, um, but it doesn't tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you though. <laughs> um, so, now, let's look at this one. Analyze the screen, what do you all see? Okay, can anyone tell me? What is the grenade button? Or do you need to see it again? It was Let's really see it again. Small. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if we can. Okay, do we have it? Is it still a bit too small? I'll try to go to full screen if y'all can't see that. Okay. Yes. Um, do we have an answer? Answer. Yep, exactly. LB. Now What's really cool is that this is the same game. The two clips that I showed you are all from the same video game. A Ubisoft, this is called Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Ubisoft, after a lot of backlash, um, at first it was like cognitive overload. There are colors on the screen of varying different things. There's just so many options to see on the screen and people could not, um, they could not alter 
their UI, their user interface, which is what you saw in the second clip that I showed you. Um, and so um, this is a great way for people to also grade up or down their abilities to play the game, right? So as you saw in the first clip, there was no UI. Um, so this is for someone who may have mastered the game and knows every single thing and really wants that big immersive experience. Or you can um, alter it where you can have the compass on or off, all the button prompts on or off, all different pop-ups going on or off. And so what I like about this, this is a great example of modularity in video games and it's a real life example. Um, yep, yeah, exactly. The game can change with the gamer. And this is a big thing. Uh, again, a big debate that goes on on, you know, how much freedom should we give the players in the video game? My stance is, are we are we doing as much as possible with having U, UD at the heart of your game design? Right. Um, and this is something that we can go on forever, um, ever, ever and ever ad nauseum. All right. The final thing here. So uh, these are the questions. What was the purpose of this game? Collect those gem things to waste time. Oh, there's too many things happening. This is actually one of my favorite games right now. And you'll see why, maybe. Those of you who like to see slot machines and the sound that is go that goes with them. I enjoy them. So what was the purpose of this game? Yep, I would say all of the above. Um, so um, I kind of cheated here. I did put this at the very middle-ish of the game. So there was a lot of things already happening on screen. In the beginning of the game, it starts off with maybe only a couple of enemies and it gradually just becomes so much more and more hectic. Um, what's really cool, this game is called Vampire Survivors. It's a one button slash joystick game. So you just press A to navigate the screen to make your selections and um, the thumbstick to move around. The attacks that were happening, the collecting that was happening, all automatic. Um, I think this is genius game design because there is art to the simplicity in it. Um, and so this really shows in my, in my opinion, you all can always, you know, disagree, right? Is that by making this game design super, super simple to kind of figure out by only needing the joystick, it allows players to still engage in something that's still pretty deep and my, in my opinion, kind of like fulfilling um, without overcomplicating things aside from the visual craziness. Um, just so you can see a comparison, this is how it actually looks like in the very beginning of the game. And all of this is auto attack. It's not doing anything except moving around and kind of navigating the maze. So that's just kind of how the game scales. Pretty genius, $5 game. Um, it, and people have been making clones of it and there are free options here. This is something that I would probably use with a client who wants to try and like get into gaming, but you know, be, because of certain um, deficits such as like cognition or orthopedic impairment, this is a great way to at least start so that they can still meaningfully engage in gaming as an occupation. Finally, we have this. There's no question um, attributed to this. I just think this is a really cool feature. This is in Final Fantasy 16, newest game that came out within this year. It's called Active Time Lore. So what you see is you can pause the game at any point and you can then review who the characters are the setting that you're in and kind of the story. So if you have someone who let's say, you know, memory is not necessarily their strong suit or you yourself having shelved this game aside for a while and are coming back to it, 
you're able to actually go back without needing to go online and trying to catch up and read everything again and get a good synopsis on what happened in the video game, who are those characters on screen, and what are their relationship with each other. I think this is an amazing baked-in feature that maybe wasn't super intentional by the game designers, but it's something that can help so many people still enjoy the story of a video game without needing to keep so many things in their head. And that's it. So these are some resources. I also have the resources in a specific handout. There are, um, I think, I believe I put four additional videos where in which the guy, there's a, a YouTuber that breaks down game design um, for different challenges or disabilities. We have here, can I play that great review site for those looking for accessibility in video games. These are written by people with disabilities reviewing the games and what they think, um, how well it does in terms of accessibility. Um, game accessibility guidelines. These are the inclusive game design elements and principles and features. So if you know someone who is interested in software development or game development, shoot them this, uh, maybe a student, shoot them over to this, you know, this is a way in which, you know, we're trying to, the gaming community is trying to make gaming more accessible for a greater audience. And Nathan, yes. Nathan, as a, a non-gamer or a, 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 it, whatever you want to call me, um, <laughs> can I, I would see that I would do something I would typically do with any kind of uh, technology or assistive technology. I would look at what are the features uh, that the person needed. Uh, do they need, you know, sound enhancement, all of those things. And then I might go into a site like, can I play that and look for a feature match? Is that a good place to start? Yes. Yes, that is a great place to start. They all, they're they also pretty um, industrious when it comes to writing reviews. So they're, they're staying up to date with all the video games that are coming out. Um, so that that's great there. Um, Able Gamers Charity, this is another charity um, that helps to try and building a community of disabled gamers. Um, I have to double check. Last time I checked, we don't have like a specific uh, organization center in here, but I know in Missouri they had a specific able gamers um, headquarters. Warfighter engages for those who are um, veterans with disabilities. This is where you can ask them to try and you know figure out ways in which you know this in this individual, this veteran, is still able to enjoy a hobby of theirs. I also include all the products mentioned. Um, in the handout as well. Here's Project Game Phase. Um, I know Toby Eye Tracker was mentioned there, so it is there. Um, here is more info about the accessibility, the Project Leonardo PlayStation thing. This is the direct website where you can go to get an Xbox adaptive controller and then the quad stick um, website. So you can kind of like explore options there. So I'm gonna stop share here. What questions do you all have? I know I just barfed out a bunch of things, so I wanna make sure that I'm able to, you know, take some time to answer. Well, Nathan, as you had the list of, um, the list of the supplies, the list of the controllers, the list of adaptations uh, as having a loan library, is there something that you would recommend? I don't say we're going to be able to buy a thousand dollar unit uh, for people to try out. Uh, I, I imagine as the end user uh, to be able to access something uh, that will lead them into their dreams. I mean, a thousand dollars may be something they could come up with funding for, but for the most part, I don't think our schools would be able to support that. And so is there something that we need to, something just very generic that someone could uh, borrow from a loan library uh, that would give them uh, some basics uh, to begin? Yeah, switches. The switch switch usage is a big one. Okay. Um, so I know that uh, pretty much all the ESDs have some sort of switch, uh, you know, inventory. Um, and I know that some districts as well have switches. So that's one way to go about it. Uh, 
I'm actually and we do doing... have we have switches in our loan library. Mm -hmm. So that is something that certainly our short term loan library 45 days that people could request from us. And I just want to, you know, when we know how many people we've got who are interested in this topic and supporting kids, I just want to make sure that there's a resource for people um, to try things out. So switches That's we got. What about the um, the Xbox adaptive interface? Surprisingly, it's only ninety nine dollars, which I know is not nothing, but in our field, that's pretty stinking cheap. And it's not totally agnostic; like you can only really use it with Xbox, and you can also correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Nathan, you can use it with um, PCs. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and it's not going to be for everybody, but it's fairly low entry rate. Um, yeah, and Christy has a, yep, Columbia Regional has one. So it'd be great to have one down there, Deb, but also just to tell folks what the heck it is. Because unless you're a nerd like me and Nathan, you may not know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I also have those resources um, in that research sheet that goes over um, kind of recapping what um, I kind of talked about today. Um, and there are some YouTube tutorials as well that I can include in that resource sheet um, if that's a need for you all. Because I want to make sure that, you know, gaming is a very important thing to many kids' lives. Um, so, yeah. Deb, I'm happy to chat with you about that if you want to just shoot an email with, and I, I can send you some of the, I was thinking also maybe an adaptive joystick. Like RJ Cooper has got some, some nice ones. Um, Xbox was making a single-handed joystick, but I'm pretty sure they're discontinuing that, which is rude, but. Well, we may have to have some uh, bake sales uh, to be able to afford all of the things that we need. I'm invested in doing that. Chandra is uh, pretty heavily into this area herself, so I know she's a resource, but I love that the people who are uh, stepping up as a great resource are here on this, uh, here on this call. Um, Thank you for that, Noel. It's time for us all to plan a trip to Community Vision. Heck yeah. So I know, I, I don't know if Leslie's still on here, but I know there was a- um... Leslie Looney, are you still here? Um, But I, I will include this as well in the resource sheet um, that this is the link that I just sent is basically the how to on Copilot. And then I'll also um, put in a video on how Copilot works. Um, that way people can follow along if that is something that is needed. It looks like Leslie had to drop off. Well, let's go ahead and stop the recording, Chandra, for today. <laughs>